Well, welcome everyone to session two, Genomic Screening Technologies. My name is Erin Ramos. I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Genomic Medicine at NHGRI, and I'm co-moderating the session with Jeff Brosco. Um, Jeff introduced himself briefly, but he's a, PD, a pediatrician and, and director of the Division of Services for Children with Special Needs at HRSA. So I will introduce our fantastic speakers try to keep us on time, and then Jeff will mostly moderate the discussion. I moved over here so I can see folks on the opposite side of the room. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so uh, Christine Eng is our first speaker. Christine is joining us from the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. She's also the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Quality Officer at Baylor Genetics. So Christine is perfectly positioned to talk to us about technical approaches and logistical considerations for population-based genomic screening. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Erin, um, and thank you very much for um, inviting me to share some perspective on um, the current state of genomic sequencing from a uh, technical and logistical um, framework. And I should say that the running title of this talk originally was Nuts and Bolts of Genetic Screening, which may be a more descriptive um, uh, idea of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I just uh, wanted to start with a summary of things that we've learned, lessons learned from optimizing high throughput genomic screening. Um, first of all, the input is very important. So there should be a consistent DNA source um, and quality. Um, we should also optimize and simplify the workflow with automation as much as possible. And this is especially important for library preparation, which has been somewhat refractory to automation, but there's been a lot of very good um, um, advances in that for now. Um, of course, it has to be cost efficient for the laboratories. And then also there should be um, a focus on continuous improvement. So there should be continual upgrade process, um, not only with the testing um, for laboratory protocols, but also for the analysis. And this can present uh, some challenges for the laboratory because with every new major change or not even so major, um, validation, uh, testing and validation is necessary. So you want to be very prudent in terms of uh, deciding when um, and which um, advances uh, you want to introduce to your workflow um, and that they must be durable. You also have to define your metrics. These are uh, pretty well understood for next generation sequencing, but um, metrics are very important to monitor throughout the process. And also um, you want to monitor them long term. And I'll be speaking about ways of, of doing this by looking at the, the results and the data that are being generated. Um, analysis, I think we touched upon this uh, a little bit earlier. I'm sure we'll be talking about it more. Um, it, it must be automated, but there's always going to be a manual component to this as well. And in order to keep your um, database um, updated is of the most um, utmost importance, but also to communicate how often that database um, is updated. And then finally, we talked about the input, but what, what about the output? There must be clear communication of reporting practices so that um, providers and patients and screenees understand exactly um, the result that they're getting. So I just wanted, um, I am CLIA lab director for both Baylor Genetics and the Human Genome Center Clinical Laboratory at Baylor College of Medicine. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, requirements um, to launch a clinical test. And I'm gonna focus mainly or uh, mainly exclusively on LDTs, but you know, as we all know, there um, is more discussion about um, oversight um, of um, laboratory developed tests. Um, first of all, they, it needs to be performed in a CLIA um, environment, a CLIA certified laboratory. Um, CAP accreditation, of course, is um, preferred as well. Um, the indication for testing um, needs to be clearly defined, um, as well as elements on the requisition, such as consent for additional testing or research uh, that we touched upon earlier today. Specimen requirements, um, the specimens that are acceptable for the test and have been validated for the test. Um, SOPs have to be generated, um, and there has to be a process for validating your reagents, your instruments, and your vendors on a regular basis. Um, 
in terms of the test design and the validation, the technical limitations of the test must be determined and disclosed um, in, with um, the rest of the description of the test. Assay interpretation also needs to be uh, fully disclosed. Um, your rationale for validation, and this can take many different forms, um, but especially with the different variant types that you're going to be reporting on. So SNVs, copy number variants, if you intend to report on those. Um, your clinical reporting criteria, again, the limitations of testing and reporting, and then importantly, the post-launch um, evaluation. So these tests, once they're validated and launched, they need to be continually monitored uh, for performance as well as for the results that are given. So if you are expecting a certain population frequency, a, a variant or a gene, you must um, continually monitor your results to make sure that there are no surprises, and that, that will address um, some of the um, false negative, false positive reporting that we've been touching on. So clinical test validation, um, and this was discussed um, in the first talk, there is analytical validation, which is, of course, your accuracy, your precision, your sensitivity, your specificity, reproducibility, limits of detection, and the choice of your validation sample. So for a, um, a large panel, um, you must um, have positive controls and validation samples that are going to be a good representation of the um, uh, genes that you're going to be assessing especially the more common ones. Um, and then, of course, the clinical validation. So what is the purpose of your test? Is it newborn screening? Is it family planning? Is it wellness? The evidence for including those genes and the actionability that is associated. So in general, these are the stages of validation of a clinical NGS test. Um, the test design, the development, and the optimi optimization. And we talked about, um, uh, I touched on some of this earlier. Um, the test scope um, is very important. So what is, you know, what is the, um, the end point of your test? Um, what is the information that you're hoping to provide to the patients? Um, the samples types and the turnaround time. So this should be very clearly communicated to um, participants so that they are not waiting for their results and they can expect their results within a, a certain time frame. The wet lab workflow um, and any automation, or um, if you can automate the whole process, uh, the QA metrics and performance uh, need to be determined. And then, of course, your pipeline needs to be established. You may need to develop additional modules for some challenging regions, um, both on the analytical side and on the technical side. And I'll talk about this um, a bit um, later. Your variant confirmation approach. So are you going to um, confirm positives um, on by an orthogonal method, or are you going to rely mainly on the metrics of your NGS analysis? Um, the test validation, as I talked about, needs to be very thorough. And we should also remember that with very high throughput testing, any weakness in your pipeline, both wet lab and analytical, is going to be exposed with high, um, high throughput. So you have to make sure that these processes um, have been tested and stress tested um, as much as possible with the volume, with difficult regions, um, and level of detection. And then the test performance needs to be monitored, at a, as I've mentioned, with QA metrics established and tracked. Um, and also importantly, sample identity, contamination to um, ensure that you're not um, having sample mix-up. And I'll talk about this a bit um, later as well. So this is a very important, it may sound simple, but a very important logistical um, concern. So the sample collection, uh, what type of sample is going to be um, accepted? Uh, these are some of the considerations in deciding which type of sample is going to be used for the test. Participant convenience is, of course, um, very important, utmost importance. Um, the laboratory should provide kitting, so um, whatever materials are needed to, um, to gather the test uh, sample um, should be provided in a kit that's going to be provided to patients, as well as detailed instructions for self-collection. And I'm talking mainly about um, where the patient is going to be collecting their own sample, not where the sample is collected, let's say, in the, in the laboratory setting of a medical center. 
Um, very importantly, there should be bulletproof labeling um, as well as downstream matching um, to the patient's contact information. This sounds um, fairly simplistic, but this is one of the major sources of error in a clinical laboratory, that labeling is not um, performed um, accurately, especially if you're testing uh, partners, multiple family members at the same time. Um, samples come unlabeled, samples come l with labels of the, the other person um, who is being tested at the same time. The cost, um, obviously, is very important. The ability to automate whatever sample you choose um, for DNA extraction. But most of these considerations have already been solved. Um, the sample stability um, during shipment um, and the time to processing. So they should be able to withstand mailing um, uh, through the postal service and some delay um, from the time that the sample is obtained to the time the sample is processed. Um, the failure rate of the chosen method should be um, assumed as well. Of course, whole blood is the gold standard with, um, I, th I think, still the lowest failure rate. Saliva is a little bit higher, maybe about 5 to 6 percent, this, though this can vary based on the quantity of saliva obtained. Um, and then also the ability to store the DNA long term, so it's stability long term if a biorepository is to be um, part of the um, part of the testing process. Um, so these are sample collection options um, from non-invasive on the left to invasive on the right. I just put some visuals in terms of um, the types of instructions that are provided to patients. I think the dried blood spots is one of the ones where you have the card and you write your name on the card. So I think there's less possibility of sample mix-up there and misidentification. But I was struck by um, the differences between the non-invasive and the whole blood method. So if you look at the whole blood, there is a health care um, provider that needs to collect the blood, and there are multiple uh, types of medical um, devices. So there's um, the needle to, to pierce the vein, there are the tubes, but then most importantly also there's the biohazards that are produced, so needle sharps and others that all have to take into consideration as resources need, needed for whole blood. Um, this is taken from a um, paper, recent paper by O'Brien and colleagues, and it's um, from the Oregon Project um, for Population Screening of Inherited Cancer and Familial Hypercholesterolemia. I know it's difficult to, to see this, but this is basically their workflow from their patient consenting to the patient asking for kits. Um, about 25% of patients who asked for kits did not return them. Um, then the sample is... Um, processed in the laboratory, and about 5% of those samples, and this was mouthwash, um, failed uh, the DNA extraction step. Um, and then taking the sample through um, NGS reporting, in this particular um, example, they did choose to um, retest a positive. Um, so um, saliva kits were sent out to presumptive positive patients, and another sample was obtained um, for orthogonal um, uh, confirmation, and this was done by Sanger. But just an example of a, um, a workflow that um, was in place for this project. Um, choice of platform for high throughput testing. Um, so just a couple of examples here. Uh, genotyping arrays, I think, were popular, um, um, maybe a little bit in the past. Uh, UK Biobank's um, project um, had an array of 800,000 markers. Um, and um, this is perhaps um, better suited for biobanks, genome centers, and other core laboratories. All of us is using a, a GDA array as part of their testing process, so they're reporting on ancestry from this array as well as doing concordance. Um, arrays are cost-effective, high throughput, low failure rate, but of course there's less flexibility after the design. Targeted NGS panels can be used as well. Um, examples are universal carrier screening panels, hereditary cancer panels. Um, there is less da data produced, which um, will allow you to have higher coverage, and this can um, result in your ability to accurately call CNVs. Um, but of course, there's less flexibility after design and a lot of um, work um, and um, curation that has to go into designing these panels. WES has less data, less cost than WGS. Um, um, of course, you have the ability to reanalyze, but you may be missing some regions that are important for PGX and potentially also um, PRS. 
WGS um, hypothesis free ability to reanalyze the highest cost and the highest amount of data. Um, and then there are some hybrid designs that I, we heard about last week at ASHG. This is a, a low-pass WGS, which can be combined with, um, you know, a relatively low-pass um, or less than a clinical-grade um, WES. Um, example of an NGS workflow. So the blue are it's, it's a technical production again to automate this as much as possible. The green is the identification of DNA variants. This can be automated, um, and the yellow is your tertiary analysis. And there are a lot of tools. So this is your annotation, filtering, um, prioritization, and then for more diagnostic tests, your variant prioritization. Um, some ex to some extent, this is becoming more automated, but there is a manual. Um, um, uh, element um, as well. Um, just Chris, wanted to just to interrupt one minute less. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, you're, um, we do have um, ability to automate some of these processes, and, and for population screening, we rely heavily on the existing databases. Um, quality metrics and can be applied. Of course, there are quality metrics that can be applied to the initial nucleic acid samples after library preparation. Primarily, it's looking at insert size, post sequencing. There are pass fail metrics, um, including the sample identity, and then the post sequencing monitoring, as I mentioned before, including what I think is important: the periodic review of your positivity rates to make sure that you're capturing um, both your positives as expected, as well as not over-reporting. Just wanted to give a, a brief example of our carrier screening panel that um, we do in our laboratory. This would be a tier four, um, as um, um, designated by ACMG. So one point that I wanted to bring up here is that Typically, these panels um, are not unidirectional, so it's not just NGS that you're doing. There are difficult genes, um, but ones that have high uh, clinical utility, such as Fragile X, um, FN, FXN, um, CYP21A2 for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. These cannot be accurately um, assessed just by a unidirectional NGS. You have to have um, as we do in our lab, another workflow. Um, so for CYP21A2, we do a long-range PCR, and then we spike it into the NGS. Um, so you have to have separate assays, and then you need to join your assays together. You also have to make sure you're taking that one sample through all the different workflows, and you're not having any sample swaps there. So sample identity becomes very important. And then. We do orthogonal confirmations for specific genes, um, especially the more challenging ones, such as SMN1. Um, I am going to, so return of results, um, we're going to have a lot of discussion about this, but of course, critical to clearly communicate the result, per, result parameters to providers and participants. And then the recontact, reanalysis, and subscription, uh, possible subscription has to be defined in advance as well. So just in summary, um, I shared an overview of the current state of clinical methods for population genomic screening. Um, there are clear distinctions between the reporting for diagnostic versus screening genomic tests, typically pathogenic likely path for screening, of course, VUS is for diagnostic. But I wanted to make the distinction that the laboratory quality measures are not distinct. They must be exactly the same for diagnostic testing as for screening. And that can put um, some challenges on a laboratory um, because of the high throughput um, um, uh, nature of this type of testing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. <clears throat> you were asked to touch on a lot in a short period of time, so thanks. So our next speaker, Bob Courier, spent more than 20 years as the chief statistician of the genetic disease screening program at the California Department of Public Health. Uh, although the focus of this workshop we heard earlier is on adult individuals, um, the lessons learned from newborn screening, I think, can and should really be factored into our discussion. So we're grateful to have you here today, Bob. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, I have no financial interest to disclose. The opinions presented are my own, and some of them are pretty strongly held. I should have 
put up the disclosure of a paper that I published a little bit ago called, uh, whose title is Newborn Screening is on a Collision Course with Public Health Ethics, which appeared in the International Journal of Newborn Screening. Anyway, uh, why focus on newborn screening? Um, the main reason is it's already the by far the largest genetic screening program in the country. Um, and in addition, the newborn period is perhaps a unique opportunity to intervene in genetic disease before symptoms develop. So one might say, well, why don't we just sequence everybody, all of the newborns, and identify all the treatable disorders and get going? Um, the goal of this, of my part of the talk, is to just say what a bad idea that would be. Um, but for, remind, for people who are less aware, um, newborn screening uh, starts with the collection of the blood card uh, about at one, eight, one day of age. Um, and usually the parents have little or no involvement in that. So newborn sc screening as a medical test is unique and not being consented. I'll avoid all of my rants about that in the talk. Um, but it then goes to the laboratory where there's a lot of um, biochemical an analysis and then the results are reported relatively quickly. They need to be reported quickly because the target disorders are serious and urgent. Um, I will say by on the way by that this, this, the, this first step of doing the biochemical analysis radically changes the, the prior probability of the, or the, the posterior po probability of disease among the positives is much higher than in the general population. Um, continuing the base that's theorem series. Um, so this is a state program, and so in the context of public health screening, generally the state has um, the usual public health ethics considerations. I want to underline at least three of them, um, that newborn screening really is universal. Essentially every baby in the country is screened. Every baby, four million a year. Um, it and as a universal program, it also applies to everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, insurance coverage, anything. It always happens, and a, a part of that is that the state program needs to be a trusted partner in the process. And when we come to genomic information, this becomes its own kind of challenge. Um, for newborn screening, the choice of disorders is really important. Um, because the parents haven't been involved, the disorders need to be certainly serious. The state justifies it by saying, this is in the best interest of the child and we have to move forward. Um, the, the baby could have a metabolic crisis at, eight, at two or three days of age if it, the, the MCAT isn't di diagnosed. Um, of course, the result, the conditions screened have to be treatable. But along the way, because the state is screening everybody, the the goal is the goal is detection of of all of the of all of the disease, um, but the screening test needs to have a low f uh, false positive rate, and consequently a high positive predictive value. On top of all of this, it's this is a hugely high throughput result. The, the state of California tests fifteen hundred babies a day. And um, that all has to happen promptly. Um, I don't think genomic testing is in that ballpark quite yet. Um, but single gene or small numbers of gene sequencing is used in newborn screening a lot after an initial positive biochemical test. And it, it has two functions. One is to reduce the false positives from the biochemical test where the other is to aid in the subsequent 
differential diagnosis of the positive result. Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, this is a this is a schematic of cystic fibrosis screening in California. The the first box there is the biochemical testing, and only about a percent and a half go on to further testing. So it's already weeded out a lot of people. Um, the first tier is uh, is actually a mutation panel. Um, at the time of this paper, it was only 40 genes in California. It's now up to 100. But on the way by, I want to point out that in addition to the usual uh, SNPs and small indels, um, cystic, there are a couple of whole exon deletions that are sufficiently common to be important. And there's some deep intronic variants. And all of this comes from knowing what's going on with many, many um, patient samples from CF. Um, in the, if if two, two mutations are identified from the panel, it goes on to the diagnostic testing. There, and there is a diagnostic testing, a sweat test for CF. Um, if there's only one mutation, it goes on to the sequencing the whole gene. And in that, I want to point to the if two or more variants are found, including any VUS or anything, um, one of them is path known pathogenic. Um, so it goes for diagnostic testing. And I will point out that if you compare the, the panel results, um, the number of CF cases, that's the N equals 138, um, and in the results from the, the variant, the, the mutation, the sequencing, the almost the same number of CF cases were identified in those two at those two stages. Turning to um, adrenoleukal dystrophy, um, in this case, the the screening test is considered positive if the baby if it passes two tiers of biochemical assays. At that point, it gets referred for diagnostic follow up, but at the same time, the, the relevant gene, ABCD1, is sequenced to help, among other things, distinguish between ALD and other peroxisomal disorders. So, but now let's consider what happens if we started to do primary population screening, that is, a, just go directly to genetic sequencing. Um, the, There are a lot of disorders that look like candidates for newborn screening, except there's no biochemical test. There's, um, they're er relatively early onset. They, um, they, they have clinical follow-up, but um, there's no test. And the group at UNC has identified over 400 gene disease pairs that would be potentially suitable for genetic screening. Um, their definition of suitable and mine of early onset are a little different, but OK, fine. Um, but and this, this, I think, is, to me, one of the really important things to think about in genetic screening, that um, when there is a diagnostic test, you can afford to consider all kinds of variants, including VUSs. That's what the cystic fibrosis model did, that you have one known pathogenic variant plus something else. Let's check it out. But when there is no diagnostic test, then, you, then you're really relying on the genetic result itself, not just to predict the genotype, but really the goal is to predict the, the, the eventual phenotype. And um, in that case, you have to just stick to what you know, which is probably, I'm, I keep thinking about autosomal recessive disease because essentially all of newborn screening is that. Um, so you really have to just refer, like, 
homozygous um, cases of a single of, of a known pathogenic variant. But given that what's known about the pathogenic variants, that starts to impact your equity. And so this is a really difficult thing. Um, the, every single gene is its own screening test. And so you have to know what you're looking for. Some diseases, like Crabbe disease, is commonly caused by a large deletion. So, so depending on the disease, you have to know, you have to know and you have to be able to um, find copy number variants. Um, and, you know, enough about VUSs. Uh, one of the things that goes with this, because the, the knowledge base isn't uniform across ethnicities, is that um, there can be racial ethnic distinctions in screening. And we'll take a look at one of those. Um, the, thing that, the thing that struck me about this paper was that the, the number of variants that were found did not seem to var vary eth according to race or ethnicity. But when it came to interpretation um, and identification of pathogenic variants, um, the, the differences were significant. And this, I think this, this is not, this shouldn't, this is probably not a surprise to anyone. Um, I keep, I, I keep focusing on um, autosomal recessive disorders because it strikes me that the notion of pathogenicity doesn't belong to a single variant in this case. It's the combination. So here's, here, these are um, uh, PAH variants, the causative gene for PKU. Um, so in each group, we have um, two homozygous variants and the, um, the compound heterozygote between them, and then looking at the frequency of various levels of disease. And so for the two groups, the, the left group and the middle group, there's one bad, there's one bad variant and one not moderately, you know, pretty, pretty okay variant. Um, the resulting compound heterozygote is in one case not so bad, and in the other case, almost as bad as the the uh, the worst the worst variant. Um, the group on the right, I think, is the most. It's it's not troubling, and it shouldn't be surprising. But in this case, the compound heterozygote is worse than either of the the homozygotes, and. It just, it just reminds us that um, enzyme structure and function isn't a linear combination of the variants that went into it. So, um, so um, it almost goes without saying, but compared to current newborn screening methods, um, Genomic sequencing is much more expensive per patient. It's um, reduced sensitivity and specificity. Um, it's, and it, um, it's, which is exacerbated by racial ethnic differences. Um, this secondary se sequencing is really valuable, but that's not what, really what we're here for. Um, and there's, there's this promise of newborn screening for all of these other disorders if we could use sequencing. So what, here's my list of things that really need to be worked on. Many of them are in progress. You, there are people here that know more about this than I do. Um, I, I really would love to have screening tests in place that distinguish between soon onset and down the road. 
Bob, sorry to interrupt, about 30 seconds left. Holy moly. Um, this is the last slide, so um, let's just say this. Um, diagnostic testing would allow the inclusion of more VUS. Um, sharing variant data, not in individual laboratory silos, but across the world, really. Um, the interpretation of compound heterozygotes, can we automate that? I don't know. Um, and there needs to be guidance, real guidance, on pre-symptomatic management of um, genetic disease. We don't, I think, my impression is that we don't have a good sense of what to do with, with um, cases that are identified with a genotype that don't yet have a phenotype. So, and thanks. Thank you so much. So our last speaker of this session before the discussion is Jonathan Berg. I know Jonathan quite well. We've worked together on ClinGen for the past 10 years. Um, Jonathan wears many, many hats at UNC, one of which is directing the program for precision medicine and healthcare, which has implemented a clinical service offering screening of CDC tier one genes. So Jonathan brings lots of experience to the discussion. Take it away. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And, you know, I think um, I'm going to pick up some threads from some of the other talks. I'll try to um, give another way of thinking about this. And, and the way that I've been kind of cogitating around this is, is really thinking about the number needed in genomic screening. So, you know, there are a couple of well-established sort of terms that are used in, uh, in medicine. Number needed to treat being uh, individuals who already have identified risk factors. How many of those do you have to treat with something to prevent that poor health outcome? Uh, versus number needed to screen, which would be the number of people you have to screen for those risk factors to find the one that you're going to um, essentially help by uh, preventing that adverse event. So all of this, as noted previously, we're talking about the risk for poor health outcomes, right? Monogenic disease, risk for poor health outcomes, polygenic risk for poor health outcomes, however we want to formulate it, that's the concept. And can we use that similar logic to examine genomic screening for monogenic diseases that convey high risk? All right, so the first part of this is going to talk about test performance and population prevalence. I probably don't have to go into too much detail about the way we classify variants, but just to put it a really fine point on it, this um, scale from benign to pathogenic is about probabilities. And there's a, there's a really sort of uh, important zone there in that orange to red where we're talking about high level VUSs and, and likely pathogenic variants that are particularly useful in a clinical context when you have a diagnostic uh, workup, as Les, Les pointed out, but also are potential pos false positives, especially when you start thinking about that um, uh, low prevalence population. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you my version of, um, of uh, 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 math based on images here uh, in the next couple slides. So if we're going to start with a population of blue people where there's a few uh, orange people in there with a monogenic disease, the prevalence of that is fixed. It, it is what it is in our population. This example is of approximately 1 in 100. Um, that's going to be at the best end in terms of the prevalence of the diseases we're talking about. So this is an optimal uh, situation. And of course, we have the test performance, which we've already talked about as being tunable, right? Which types of variants are we going to include as positive screens? That's going to yield us a population of patients, some of whom are the people with disease, and some of whom don't have that disease but have been picked up because of the way that we set that, that tuning. And so then we can calculate things like the true positive rate, the false positive rate, and sensitivity of the test. And I've given this one an 80% uh, sensitivity. And we can also calculate the false positives and, the, and they're, they're in the specificity, which in this one I've given a 99% specificity. And you can kind of see how those numbers relate to each other. Um, of course, this is just determining whether an individual has or likely has that disease, right, with all of the caveats about their prior probability to have it, um, not whether they're going to develop the symptoms of the disease. So we're going to get there in just a minute. All right, so let's start with those groups. Now we can do our uh, math, right? So you've got your four uh, true positives divided by all of the positives. That's your positive predictive value. So in this particular example, we've got 67% positive predictive value. That's going to be very good performance compared to um, the 
prevalence as we're, we'll look out for other conditions. Um, and the negative predictive value is going to be very high, almost no matter what sensitivity we choose to use as our threshold, because there's so many people in the population and because these conditions are so rare. So what then is the number needed in this case? So I'm going to use a number needed to diagnose, and I use the term diagnose as a uh, molecular diagnosis, if you will, probability of a molecular diagnosis, that one true positive person. And that's going to depend on the sensitivity. Um, and so this is an example table, just basic calculations of the prevalence of the condition, and then setting out some kind of basic clinical sensitivity and specificity values that relate to each other in terms of the fact that if you're going for 100% clinical sensitivity, your clinical specificity is going to get pretty low. And if you go for the, the maximum clinical specificity, your sensitivity is going to suffer. But that's, that's the trade-offs that we're going to have to make. Um, and so you can see with a 1 in 250 condition, like perhaps HBOC, something in that realm, um, you know, if we're going to be going for a midline clinical sensitivity of 90% with a specificity of up to perhaps 99%, we're still going to end up with uh, about three false positives for every true positive. There's just going to be some leakage of those people into our, um, into our population. And it gets what much, much worse the rarer the conditions get. Um, you almost can't do screening for a one in a million condition with anything other than the absolutely well-known pathogenic variants, or you'll just wind up with lots and lots of false positives. Okay, so what are some critical values? And this gets to the research questions. We have to get to the prevalence of these monogenic conditions. So we know where to start from in terms of those priors. Um, most estimates we have are pretty much hand-waving guesses, right? This is about a 1 in 50,000 condition or whatever. Um, but there is nice population ascertainment now from biobanks where we can look for the path and likely path variants. We saw some examples of that earlier. Um, we could um, use those numbers to get a baseline ballpark. Uh, but, of course, there's going to be some questions about whether those people uh, are actually truly uh, having that disease or not, um, based on that ascertainment. Um, but that could give us at least a lower bound estimate. All right, here's another way to think about thresholding the clinical performance of genomic tests. So I'm thinking about this not now as a single variant that's coming back, but as the population of variants that might come back from a given test. And if you had a distribution, something like this, where it's almost a, a frequency histogram of number of variants reported, um, if this were the, the characteristics of your test and you had a couple of uh, sort of the higher level likely path and path variants that gave you a pretty high percentage of the cases overall, you could get a reasonable sensitivity at very high specificity. But then you'd have to ask yourself, is it worth gaining a little bit of additional sensitivity down into that orange realm at the cost of some reduced specificity. So how much value do you get out of pushing your uh, threshold down? Um, obviously, the better we understand pathogenic and benign variants, the better catalogs we have. Shout out to ClinGen. Uh, if we can eventually get the MAVE data uh, to, to really help us classify these variants and, and separate them so that essentially we're pushing things to path or pushing things to benign, then we will do better with our um, predictive uh, ability. Oh, and I would just point out, I think this is an area where we could ask our clinical labs to help us with this. So for people who are clearly uh, have a high, high, high prior probability of a given monogenic disease, what kinds of distribution of these variants do you see in that population would be an interesting way to look at that. Okay, so the clinical performance is going to be something we need to learn and understand to know to calculate the number needed. Um, uh, if you have a variant that's responsible for all cases, then you can really uh, go with that variant. That's going to give you a lot of information. But obviously, most diseases have a much more complex mixture of variants, and that's going to uh, cause us some problems in terms of really estimating what our sensitivity and specificity is. Um, and I, I, I would also add that the, compl the complexity of the combinatorial diplotype of recessive conditions and which two variants an individual has even, even greatly more complicates that. Okay. So part two is about penetrance, actionability, and preventing poor health, health outcomes. This is why we're doing the screening. So under normal risk management for that whole general population that are true negative, they're getting their appropriate routine management, they're individualized by family history, et cetera, they're getting average population outcomes. That's great. Um, the one individual that we missed on our test uh, is a false negative is likely getting inappropriate routine management. Uh, we might 
not be able to help that. And they do have the opportunity for clinical diagnosis. So there is still a safety net for that person in the sense that they're probably getting uh, at least some amount of medical, medical evaluation and follow up for, for things generally. Under high-risk management, we're going to have our two false positives who are getting inappropriate high-risk management. This gets to the, the harms uh, that are likely going to exceed the benefits for these individuals. And they'll have below average outcomes probably. Um, if we look at our four individuals who are positive, now you have the advantage of cascade testing. I'm not going to talk too much more about that. But within those, we have what we've previously talked about of disease penetrance, right? This is a fixed value for the condition. And some of the people will be non-penetrant. Um, that's the one person that kind of comes up to the top there. I refer to this as overdiagnosis. They truly do have that monogenic disease. We're just going to be treating them more than they need to be. Um, whereas the three people in the bottom uh, circle there are going to potentially benefit from the high, uh, high risk management. So these are going to be the will be penetrant people. And our goal is for them not to become penetrant. We want them to not develop that disease either because we've treated them prevented it, picked it up early, et cetera. And we want to convert those into light blue dots. We're not going to be successful all the time, right? So in this example, we've sort of prevented that poor health outcome in about two thirds of this population, likely going to benefit uh, those individuals more than we harm them and hopefully have above average outcomes. Now, this non-penetrant overdiagnosed per person goes in with the false positives. This is someone who we are not helping by all of that high-risk management. They were never going to develop disease anyway, so all we can do is harm them by whatever it is that we do. So this is a way to calculate the number needed to treat. In this case, there are six people being treated. Only two of them benefited. We get an NNT of three, right? And so these numbers could actually be calculated through um, some of our population research to figure out what that actually looks like. Um, timeline is also important. If we're screening prior to symptom onset, then we have a greater opportunity to mitigate those harms. Uh, we're going to potentially have more people that we can prevent that disease in. But if we're starting the screening coincident with the onset of disease, well, some of those people have already had that disease. It's not going to change their outcomes at all. And we saw that some of that example in the biobank data. If we're starting the screening after symptom onset, then the best thing we can do is identify people that should have been diagnosed anyway and potentially uh, improve their family health through cascade testing. So what do we need to know? We have to know the penetrance of monogenic disease for each of the diseases we're screening for. Uh, we obviously have ascertainment bias from the affected populations that we've studied so far. Um, we're going to probably have a much lower penetrance for population screened patients. Um, that's going to increase the number needed to treat since the proportion of individuals that would benefit are going to start to go down. I think we also need to better characterize the age-based natural history. When do symptoms start? When do people start to develop the poor health outcomes? And when can we time the intervention so that we pick up those people before that happens? Okay, so a couple strategies. One is to follow up the tests, right, on all positives. Like we have a gold standard test we do. Well, that's going to cost money, and we need to calculate that into our cost of screening. But we could potentially resolve some of those people as false positives. They are actually negative, and then they go on to get appropriate management. There's the issue of how to deal with this incomplete penetrance, right? Well, one way to do that is through what I refer to as proximal surveillance, some low burden way of following people, maybe generating some additional data, looking at their family history more closely, finding out a little bit more about their risk and characterizing it so that some of those people are going to go on and get low burden care for their lifespan and not get something uh, definitive done, whereas others might trigger a definitive intervention because of a phenotype that develops, right? There's a um, slight widening of the aorta. Somebody's following that. It hits a point where they then need the surgery, that kind of thing. On the other hand, you could really work on the refined risk assessment and really try to triage people into those who really don't need a whole lot of additional management and those who do need whatever that definitive management is. And this might be the sort of thing that you would bring into a um, the decision making about something like prophylactic surgery, right? How are we going to decide which people to remove an organ from uh, based on that risk? And so that's going to really have to require some detailed uh, medical workup and decision making. And I think that's going to be costly. And I don't, I'm, I'm not sure we're capturing that effectively in our uh, current estimates of cost. 
Um, so essentially, we need these strategies, and they need to be de defined for each condition that we're going to be doing screening for, uh, and we need to build this into the cost of a screening program so that we're not just thinking about how cheap it is to do the DNA sequencing, but we're thinking about all of the costs of the management. Okay, so cr critical value to know. What this is another way of saying clinical utility. I'm taking actionability and making it quantitative. What is the quantitative actionability of each monogenic disease? Sorry, Jonathan, one minute left. Got it. I have one slide. So um, how much reduction in morbidity and mortality will we expect to get, right? Can we really put our, uh, put our hands on that? How effective are those strategies to reduce the false positives and mitigate the overdiagnosis? And in the absence of any controlled trials or 20-year follow-ups, how are we going to estimate what that number needed to treat is really to achieve those, uh, to reduce the poor health outcomes. So going back to my toy example, um, again, this is sort of a best case scenario because it's a fairly high prevalence condition. I've given it pretty good test performance characteristics. Um, estimating the number needed to screen. Uh, we've got a, about 125 people to find one diagnosis. The number needed to treat is about three. So we would need to screen 375 people to find one person who we're gonna help. And in doing that, we're going to identify people who are false positives and overdiagnosed, and we're going to do them harm. And so we have to make sure that we're balancing that um, as we think about these conditions. So the conclusions then, uh, we need this key evidence. We need monogenic disease prevalence for the things that we're considering screening for. We really need to understand the clinical test performance and the spectrum of variants that we're getting out in each of these diseases. Uh, we really need to understand the natural history, the age of onset, and the penetrance for these conditions in the population, not just in our ascertained uh, affected cohorts. And we need these quantitative actionability estimates to know how effective our interventions are going to be. And then based on that, I think we're going to do what Les was suggesting, is tune the thresholds for what variants get disclosed based on what the condition is and what we're going to be recommending for the uh, people that have it or that, that at least screen positive for it. And think about incorporating some of this into the cost effectiveness models to really give us a better sense of where in that process are the key features that we have to um, really tune to, to get the best performance out of screening. So I'll end there. And I think we have. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Christine, Bob, and, and Jonathan. It was a really neat follow up to what the first talks were this morning. Christine sort of leading us through what happens, has to happen in the lab, and, and Bob talks what happens at the state lab and some of the concerns about that. And then Jonathan with this nice model for how to do it at a population level. Um, I guess one of the things that was sort of missing a little bit in sort of taking off on my previous questions about um, the health system and how well it functions is also how well screening at a population level gets followed up. And so at HRSA, we not only fund the, the um, advisory committee of newborns, which uh, of course net chairs, and how the things get onto the RUSP, but we also fund states for doing newborn screening follow-up. Um, and so that whole system, we, we didn't really say much about that. So, so we start off, Bob, I wonder if you could say a little bit about your experience in California, about what it takes when you do population level screening to make sure that you follow up on all those kids. That's a, a key part of any, any large screening program. Yeah, thanks. Um, so all of the newborns that are identified with a positive screening result are referred to the appropriate specialist for diagnostic evaluation. And that, I think, that happens essentially immediately and is really quite universal. I mean, again, it's part of the newborn screening program. All of that communication takes a lot of, well, keeping track and monitoring. From after the diagnosis, um, things start to fall apart, uh, depending on how intensive the clinical management becomes and where where the family lives. I mean, in California, there are families that live four hours from the nearest geneticist. Um, and so they don't get the kind of care that they, that people in other parts of the state get. Um, and that's just geography. There's also language and, and um, well, just general uh, socioeconomic status and every, and, and and then, and insurance coverage starts kicking in. So, so the gaps in long-term follow-up are real. I think I'll stop there. 
Thanks, Bob. I see Ned and then Kaylin and then um, Terry and then Heidi. But just before I do, so I think this raises an important issue for thinking about the research agenda, that we don't stop our process diagrams at we have a diagnosis and the clinician knows. There's a whole lot of things that happen downstream. And what we've learned from newborn screening is if we don't calculate that into the number needed to treat, we're missing out on something important in our calculations. Ned. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Bob, I appreciated your <clears throat> discussion. Uh, and, and I agree with you. I, I did want to come back to something less said that all oh, those false positives, you know, we just diagnose them. It's way more complex than that. And we're doing research into the harms associated with uh, reporting a false positive result back to a parent and that odyssey that they have to go on to say you, you don't have a disease that's going to cure your child in the first year of life uh, and you don't need a bone marrow transplant. I think the other thing you talked about is the immediacy of treatment. And so CRAB-A is difficult because the bone marrow transplant has to happen so rapidly to be effective that the, there's worry about the chances to make a, a mistake in that diagnosis. So we're not supposed to talk about newborn screening. Let's think about how these apply to adults because it's not that much different. If you have a false positive result, I, I would argue that wrong information is always a harm. And treating a false positive or an overdiagnosis is also always a harm. And so it's always that balance. And so Jonathan, the only thing I would add to your wonderful talk is calculating the number needed to harm. All the therapies we're talking about, all the interventions to follow up on a positive genetic test also carry harms. None of our therapies or approaches are harm free. And so always thinking about, yes, I only have to screen three to, um, to benefit somebody. How many people do I screen before I end up with a harm? So I just always like to come back to harms. Can I just quickly respond? So like, yeah, I, I agree with you, right? That the, the number of false positives will, you know, I think if we just trust the math, right, that these results are not 100% specific, if we're talking about likely pathogenic variants, then you could get astronomical numbers of false positives, and that would just become overwhelming. And so I think that's part of the issue is tuning the types of results you would give back to keep it so that you're at least in a manageable number of false positives, and then try to get strategies to, to reclassify those and sort them out. I, I think your name is Caitlin. I can't read sideways. So I think my question is pretty directed for um, Christine, but of course others um, chime in. I, I'm curious around the sample collection element here, and um, if you have thoughts or recommendations for criteria that organizations who are trying to implement population screening um, might use to help make decisions about what sample collection method to implement um, and thinking about from a practical perspective, um, you know, we've at MUSC have started with saliva sample collection and are doing that in clinical settings as well as at home, um, have not gone into blood yet, but, um, you know, because of the logistical barriers, but just would love to hear your thoughts around the decision tree or decision making there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think this needs a, a lot of consideration, um, you know, first about what your sample volume is going to be, um, and then how your, what your outreach is going to be. So if they're going to be seen at a medical center and it's going to be um, somehow combined with a visit, then your options are you know, much greater than if this is going to be mainly by you know, outreach through social media or, or other types of um, approaches. Um, I think from studies that have taken place so far, it's been mainly non-invasive testing. Um, and from the slide I showed, and, and again, I was surprised at, at the level of complexity of the blood draw versus these other non-invasive. So you know, you really have to think about the resources that are needed um, and whether the incremental um, improvement you get in you know, sample viability and lower failure rates and long-term storage, you know, if, if, is that meaningful? Um, also, the mislabeling, and, and there is no um, foolproof method for this yet, and that has to be developed. 
Um, as I mentioned, the Guthrie card, the um, dried blood spot card, where you actually put your name on the card and then collect your sample, I, I think is maybe the closest. But anything where you have to put a label on a tube is prone to error. Um, and then marrying up um, the patient information downstream to the sample. That's critical as well. But no, we don't have. As far as I know, we don't have, um, you know, guidelines, um, but I, I think that is definitely needed depending on the scenario. And just one follow-up. Um, I think it's been, uh, maybe it's post-COVID, maybe it's just getting used to uh, fit tests and at-home sample collection. It's just been really amazing to see how um, people are, are responsive to the at-home collection. And so I think that's been a lesson learned and really a surprise seeing um, high uptake of people wanting to do at home and then high return of those. Um, so, thank, thank you. I forgot to mention that during my talk. But yes, I think the at-home COVID tests have really um, sort of made people more knowledgeable and, and no, not so um, anxious about handling their own samples. Yeah. I wonder if while we're on the, the technical stuff, Christine, if you could say a word about um, reanalyzing for variants and later on how the, the practical aspects of that, have, have you started thinking about those kinds of things? Yes. Uh, so reanalysis is, um, e even today in a diagnostic setting, it is a challenge. Um, so, you know, making sure that patients are aware that you know, whatever result they've gotten is in a particular window of time. And then um, making sure that your reanalysis protocol um, is very well understood and communicated, and that should, should be in, and is in our, like, exome and genome consent forms, how often reanalysis um, is performed. But in the laboratory, it's also, you know, a challenge. You have to, you know, have teams that are dedicated to, you know, your database and um, making sure that, you know, whatever changes you make um, to your previous interpretations um, are well vetted. Um, because, you know, you're going to have to reach out to those patients again. So it's, a, it's, it's definitely um, a, not an easy um, process, but you have to have the resources dedicated in your laboratory, the protocols, and, and follow them. Well, Heidi, you probably have some thoughts on this as well. Well, could I just make a quick comment about dried blood spots? That um, That's what newborn screening is. Those spots if stored at minus 40 with desiccant, um, can be analyzed after 20 years um, and give good DNA for an exome or a genome. Yeah, I, I wonder if there are any differences between the dried blood spots that are collected by a healthcare professional. So newborn screening, I think, is usually you know in the hospital um, versus those that are um, you know collected at home. So I. I was not able to find any data about that. But what do you know what the failure rate is typically for newborn screening programs statewide? Um, less than 2%. I have Terry and then Heidi and then Josh. Uh, we could talk about reanalysis all day long, but I think we'll hold that. I have a technical question, but you go ahead. Great. Yeah, I wonder, Jonathan, if you could expand a little bit on, on your comment on, you know, how do we get at prevalence of monogenic diseases? And presumably, yes, monogenic, but, you know, breast cancer isn't monogenic, um, and, and yet we're, we're looking for a, a particular gene variant. So, so both, you know, how do you, how do you ex expand maybe to complex diseases as well as, you know, what would be the, the approach to assessing that prevalence? Yeah, so I mean, I, I've seen sort of the, the extrapolated numbers based on, you know, if you if you say that of breast cancer, some percentages are related to this gene or that gene, and then you sort of extrapolate from the population prevalence of breast cancer to get the prevalence of the of that monogenic form, right? So that's one way to go about it. Um, I think that there's actually, I, my guess is that polygenic risk is probably going to be more directly sort of applicable straight into the kind of the the risk that a given individual has at a level of polygenic score that they have as opposed to with you know with our penetrance issues somebody might have a brca variant but we, then we know what well, the risk for them is some percent by some age um 
is that modified by their other polygenic factors? Is it modified by environmental factors? Sort of how does all of that work together, which I think is a lot harder. Whereas I think with at least the polygenic risk, you've sort of evened out across all of the other factors that might be involved in the risk. You know? So um, I think you go directly from the projected risk based on the polygenic score, perhaps combined with other environmental things if you're doing a genomic sort of risk predictor um, that might be more direct to, to, to the risk of the individual. So this one's a little more, uh, oh, Heidi Rehm, uh, Mass General Hospital and Broad Institute. Um, so this is a little probably directed at Christine's talk. Today we have, and you gave the great example of a carrier screening, sort of tier four, lots of genes, but you also have to supplement that with certain assays because of more difficult to detect uh, variation in certain genes, Fragile X, SMA, et cetera. Um, in the secondary findings world, we accept that those tests aren't comprehensive. In fact, certain genes have been left off the list knowing that they're technically challenging. And so we sort of view it as opportunistic. If you happen to come across it, report it, but we're not assuming it's comprehensive. And I'm wondering how we all think about the middle of the road here where we're all starting to think about run a genome at birth and use it throughout the lifetime, kind of cost effectiveness approach. But that means that we'll be taking tests like carrier screening and sticking them on a, a genome where they're not optimized for the comprehensiveness of when we design a test for a specific task. And how do we think about using, labeling those tests that are not perfect, but we also, the cost to make them perfect would make them less useful at a population level. And, and how, how do we make it clear what this test is compared to the gold standard, you know, ordered intended for carrier screening, for example, versus, you know, we're trying to do this, but it's not perfect. Do you have thoughts about how to label offer that kind of scenario? Yeah, very challenging question. Um, I mean, I think we do, um, you know, run up against this in the diagnostic world already, um, where, you know, we have our disclaimers um, and, you know, many labs do this gene by gene, and the list becomes overwhelming. You know, exon 5 in this gene, you know, exon 52 in this gene are not well covered. Um, and so understanding that and then being able to take that information and translate that to the patient to tell them, you know, exactly, you know, how good this test is for you is, is you know, very difficult. Um, I think for, let's say, our carrier screening test, um, where, you know, patients are voluntarily or to some extent voluntarily taking this test, you know, you want to give them as good um, a test as possible. And so that's why, you know, these orthogonal mes um, methods are, are being introduced in order to get, you know, the sensitivity where it should, where patients expect it to be. Um, but, you know, I, I think looking at a population level, obviously it's going to be different and you're going to have to, you know, balance cost and time, um, you know, with patient expectations. Thank you. I think Josh is uh, next. Yeah, hey, Josh Peterson at Vanderbilt. Um, this is a question directed at Jonathan. Um, so um, it, it seems like the sensitivity specificity framework works pretty well for identifying a genetic risk and uh, false positives and, and true positives, that sort of thing. But I worry a little bit about using that framework for identifying essentially the connection between the risk and the disease because of time. Um, and, you know, every, it's, there's a distribution of disease incidence over time, and when you go to apply, let's say, the idea of penetrance to an individual uh, person that you're trying to counsel or treat, um, then you need to, of course, account for how old they are, uh, but also uh, essentially when they got that information. So if we're going to be screening 18-year-olds, uh, you know, how do you counsel them and what do we need to know? What's the right metric to communicate um, essentially that risk that connects the genetic risk to uh, the actual time-related risk of disease? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, that's the, it's the big problem, right, is 
the goal is to find the people before they have symptoms of disease so that we can do something to prevent them from having disease so they never become penetrant, right? And, and, and so I think it'll be, as we sort of roll out screening in the context of, of the interventions that we want to do with people, it's gonna be really hard to tell like which of these people who have that pathogenic variant are gonna benefit from the whatever intervention we're offering them, right? And so that trick of sort of communicating the population benefit that may not actually be an individual benefit is gonna be something that differs from when, you know, we sort of think about individualized medicine, right? That we're doing this for individual benefit. We're actually not, we're doing it for population benefit. And that's part of the communication, I think, of, of what those results mean for that person. Yeah, I was just, maybe this is part of the research agenda. I was just struck by some recent articles that showed that, you know, you could show stick figures uh, in a diagram and you get twice the sort of actionability based on what, what patients like to do compared to, let's say, a single probability number. So, I mean, it's not only the, the, the metric itself, but the way that you communicate it. And it seems like we really need to know more about that in the context of genetics. And, and maybe to add to that, it's also the consent process up front, right? That when, when someone's signing up, we probably see this in clinical medicine all the time right now that this happens to me as a primary care person where one of the specialists has ordered a test because someone had an eye finding and then they find a bunch of things they don't know what to do with and they get sent to me. And I don't know how much counseling was done up front. So it's both once we have result, but even before, I think understanding that better probably makes sense too. I have Aaron and then Carol and then Mark. Thanks. So we heard someone mention um, all of us and we know other databases like NOMAD are increasing their representation from individuals from diverse genetic ancestries. Um, but what else sort of are we at the point or are those will those be sufficient? You know, we heard Jonathan, you, you saying sort of we have to tune our decisions to maximize, um, you know, true positives and minimize false positives. Do we can we do that yet? Do we have the data from diverse ancestries to make sure those ch choices are going to benefit all? I mean, the answer is probably not yet, and certainly not for more of the rare diseases. Um, again, I, and I think it's, it, yes, you have to, um, if, if the well-established pathogenic variants are concentrated within people of European ancestry because we've seen them the most and studied them the most, then that's going to be a problem. And we'll have to figure out how to address that and make sure that the, the catalog of well-established well pathogenic variants is diverse so that we can benefit most people. And maybe a quick follow-up to that, Jonathan. How do, how do we, or, and maybe Christine can help with this as well, and Bob, how do we get these new data streams. So as we get more data, how do we make sure it goes someplace like ClinVar so we can use it going forward? Have you guys thought about that much? So, sorry, well, I was not paying attention. Oh, oh, yes. Um, so, I mean, we're like, for instance, we're right now working on the submission from the All of Us Research Program, which obviously has a larger diversity. We're also working through the Global Alliance to, uh, globally to try to get every country to submit and support their submissions because uh, you can't submit variants, you don't test you know, from patients. So I, I think it's, it's just a, a widespread model to uh, sort of support data sharing at various levels, including interpretation and ClinVar submission, but also the, the raw data and how we all use that. Um, you know, we just launched Nomad V4 last week, and the contribution of new variants, despite the fact that we dumped huge amounts of European individuals into this database, there's a very small increase in the number of variants from Europeans that were above a certain frequency that lets you exclude it. The contribution of the smaller number, 130K of non-European, was massive, um, and it just really demonstrates just how important diversity of data is, not only for interpreting the population it's in, but interpreting other populations. Thank you. So Carol, my question you was kind, okay. of, kind of similar in that, um, Jonathan, you mentioned uh, MAVE, sort of the multiplex assay of variant effect, and how data from that sort of project could feed into 
understanding the effect of all of these diverse variants that are reported? And I mean, what, what's your vision for how to integrate those types of data into this um, uh, assay? So I, I would see the need for a good level of communication between the ACMG committee that's starting to say these are the things that we think are worth population screening for, ClinGen and expert panels to get really high quality specifications for classifying those variants and the MAVE groups to tackle those genes, right? And between all of that, you should be able to have a really good catalog of clearly pathogenic variants and hopefully not as many that are likely path or kind of in that wishy-washy range so that those things could be rolled out with confidence, right? That's the goal. I think that'd be a really good project. Uh, Mark Williams Geisinger, so this is a comment rather than a question, but I'm happy to have others comment on my comment. Um, and uh, this comes back to um, the idea that when you do screening, um, the balance of sensitivity and specificity results in residual risk, uh, which also needs to be communicated, uh, and false reassurance. And we have um, plenty of examples from newborn screening uh, and also from even direct-to-consumer testing like 23andMe, where somebody has an obvious family history for uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and they say, well, I don't need testing because I had 23andMe. Uh, or uh, a child that presents with chronic rhinosinusitis and pneumon uh, pneumonitis and poor growth and uh, floaty stools and it says, well, I had newborn screening for cystic fibrosis, so we don't need to do a sweat test. So I think one of the other aspects of this that we need to consider is downstream, how do we communicate the idea that this is screening, we are intentionally going to be missing people, some for technical reasons that these are just genes or, or regions that we just can't get at, and others for um, rare diseases that don't meet the um, thresholds that we would define for um, screening, uh, and how do we facilitate um, recognition and testing? So at ASHD last week, um, there was a, some discussion um, and, and some of the sessions about whether genetic counseling is actually needed for negative results. So, you know, we're all, you know, very familiar with genetic counseling for these types of programs for positive results. But what about the negatives? And it, is that actually just as important or perhaps even more important um, that, you know, um, participants aren't left with the impression that they're no longer um, they have to be concerned about this particular issue. Yeah, and to add on to our discussion from the first thing, if we are arguing, as some of us are, perhaps all of us are, that we don't have sufficient genetic counseling resources to do the positives, uh, then I think we can fairly well assume that we definitely don't have enough resources for the negatives. So then it raises the question of how do we um, develop resources that can achieve some, I won't say equivalence, but at least some acceptable level of communication uh, for those particular issues, since we know we won't have the human resources to be able to do it, nor can we afford the cost associated with that. So, so I'm going to say that the you know, part of what Les said earlier was kind of these automated and, and, and you know, computational ways of doing this. And I think that the genomic learning healthcare system is going to need to know Somebody's gotten screening, what their results were, but also all of the other phenotypic stuff that you just mentioned and the probability that that represents a disease, right? So that you can calculate what is the actual Bayesian kind of relationship between the fact that they had a negative screening test with its performance versus all of the phenotypic stuff and does another test need to be done? And how does the, how can we rely on the EHR to pull that information together and flag it for somebody to act on? which I think will be a really interesting challenge for us. Yeah, yeah it's, it's well outside the realm of this, but I think some of the work that's being done at Vanderbilt and other places to say we've got data in the EHR that can make it so that we're not reliant on between the years, which we know is going to not be successful to really flag folks and say, um, uh, this is an individual that definitely needs to be tested for CF or whatever based on a very high um, uh, um, confidence phenotype um, that raises that prior probability. Sounds an awful lot like a genome-informed risk consent from eMERGE. Uh, 
I'm going to call a quick timeout because I think you guys are purposely trying to confuse me. If your card is up and you don't have a question, if you could put it back down so I can figure out who's in next. All right, excellent. I think it's, I think actually Dan is next and then Caitlin and then Terry. Thank you. So three random comments. One is um, uh, I appreciate the shout out for uh, the, the phenotype risk score, Bark, but we actually looked at CF and <clears throat> Lisa Bastarash really couldn't find any couldn't find any undiagnosed CFs using the phenotype risk score. So that's an example of the phenotype risk score not finding extra cases. But I appreciate the shout out anyway. Um, the the business of counseling negatives. I, I think that that um, that comes back to what. Les was saying, I mean, if somebody has a very clear phenotype, so I, I, I'm an arrhythmia guy, so if somebody has a QT interval of 550 milliseconds and their genetic testing is negative, they still need to be followed by somebody who knows something about QT intervals of 550 milliseconds. On the other hand, if it's population screening and they were screened for because they don't have an indication, I, I can't see that we need to counsel those people. And then I just have a comment about the MAVES. Uh, we're, we're, we're sort of, uh, I, I would say we've put more, we've put several toes in the water around MAVES. And uh, one of the things I'm, I think I'm learning is that it, the, what, what MAVES do is assign pathogenicity or not, depending on a particular protein function that's being interrogated. So you can never be sure if you have a particular variant that looks benign on one assay, whether it's going to be benign on all the other assays that you might want. And obviously, the field is moving very, very quickly. And, and MAVEs have nothing to do with penetrance, at least as near as I can tell. So that there's this, still this penetrance problem we're going to be left with. And the other problem that, that somebody's going to have to solve with MAVEs is that um, there, there are a couple of hundred KCNQ1 variants, for example, perhaps even less than that, that have been annotated by ClinVar and ClinGen. And when we do a KCNQ1 MAVE map, there are 13 and a half thousand variants. And so there's a problem of scale and how we're going to sort of uh, be able to accommodate levels of evidence and, uh, and just be able to present data in a, in a chewable fashion to the wider community. A separate discussion, I think, but worth, I have to say something about MAVE. Any of our folks want to respond to those comments? All right. Um, if Caitlin, you put yours down. Well, you know. Oh, okay. I, Go ahead. I thought I was allowed to. Uh, so I was going to follow on to uh, Mark's comments. I think um, there are, as far as research agenda and uh, research questions, a lot of um, opportunities to think about from a behavioral perspective what's happening with people who have negative results. Are they? Um, how are they interpreting that? What are they doing with regular screening behaviors? Are they? You know, stopping screening uh, because of uh, the way that they've interpreted their their results. So um, I would just maybe emphasize that um, as a potential research direction. Um, and then I think too, um, highlighting some of the work that um, Kim Cappings and Guillermo Del Fiol from Utah have done um, in the in the Bridge trial and in their ITCR um, work with returning negative results using a chatbot for um, genes associated with HBOC and Lynch. And um, they've seen a, a non-inferiority to returning those negative results um, with chatbot through standard care. And I think that, you know, it's not population screening, but is potentially a really good example of, um, of a mechanism to be returning and educating folks about the negative uh, results. So quick comment on your first point, which I think is a really good one. Um, if I see a teenager who is obese or overweight and I check the cholesterol and it's normal, does that mean that they say, oh, now I can do anything I want, right? And if someone does a whole genome sequence and it's nothing shows up, does that mean I can dro drink and smoke and do whatever I want because I don't have any risk factors? So I think research in that area is probably critical as you're pointing out. Comments from our panel. And you guys are quiet. <laughs> All right, I think of Terry and then at the end of the table, I can't see your name, sorry. Kate. Uh, yeah, so I just was curious, Caitlin, what is ITCR? That wasn't my question. but. You asked me too fast. Um, it's a funding mechanism through the NCI. Oh. Um, and so it's focused on developing algorithms for um, helping to identify cancer risk and then tools and resources. Okay. 
Great. Uh, my question actually was for, for Bob Courier. Um, when you said that, that when, some, when a diagnosis is made in a child, and again, we're not talking about newborn screening, but we can get lessons from it, um, they're referred to an appropriate specialist, um, which leaves, you know, there's lots of arrows uh, along the way to that that you, you commented on. But I, I wonder, you would think that that would be sort of the upper limit of, of who would respond, who would actually follow up, et cetera, and that in, in adults who have freedom of choice, et cetera, it would be much lower. And I wondered, is there any estimate of who actually, you know, what proportion who screen positive actually get into care and get appropriate care? You um, say no, if that's the answer. Well, I, I, we, we, we do know that I would say over 95% of positives get to, get to a diagnosis. Um, the after that, I really don't have. Un, unfortunately, the way the newborn screening system in California is set up, after after a diagnosis is made, the positive case management is handed off to mostly CCS. Um, the uh, CCS. Uh, it's the care of children with special needs. Oh, really? Oh, okay. it's, an, it's another part of the state health system. And newborn screening actually doesn't get data back about long-term care, long-term follow-up. Um, so it's, it's, it's very hard to, to really have a sense of that. So, so I will say at HRSA that we are now funding both Propel grants and Co-Propel grants for, for states to be able to f do a longer-term follow-up. Um, and you're, you're right, Bob, that there doesn't generally happen. I will give you just one example that we know of what may happen in Ohio where they're screening for Crab A and there's not a secondary test for cyclazine. They have a high number of false positives. And more than half of kids get completely lost to follow-up. So I identified newborn screening as being positive for, for but no follow-up and so it's really concerning what can happen yeah and just to, you know to follow on that i think you know there's this connection for each state to have the who's going to follow up these results or the state lab is making sure that those are getting acted on by someone um, will there be something similar in a adult population screening program is it the responsibility of a health system to identify those pathways is it the state that does it? I mean, how are we going to figure that out? It's a patchwork and it'll be a problem. And I think we're going to have to rely on our primary care providers and educate them on what to do when they get a positive, because that's going to be the first person that often sees these people, what to do next. And, and I think it's an important distinction, right? In the newborn screening, since it is a fairly state mandated test, you could argue that if the state is doing this, there's some obligation to make sure there's a follow-up. What we're talking about so far in adults, though, it's not a state mandated, so it does probably fall on the healthcare system and likely the PCP. I think Kate was down at the end there, wanted to ask a question. Okay, online. Okay, so after Kate, online, and then. All right. Uh, just a quick, uh, the ITCR is actually a general technology um, mechanism through the NCI. I've been on that study section several times now, so all sorts of technologies. Screening is just one of the many technologies. Um, uh, so the other thing I was just going to comment about the negative results um, is that um, there's clearly a trend. Um, I was just on an ESAB for um, clinical programs to start returning negative results through a uh, portal and through low risk VOS that um, more and more institutions, especially because of sort of the workload of genetic counselors have really started moving towards returning those results that way. I, I realize it might be slightly different for population screening, but I, I think you're going to see a real clinical trend towards uh, results being returned. Um, and obviously, they, people have a mechanism to ask questions through the portal if they have a question. But um, my impression is that that is really increasingly being adopted in many, many clinical settings, just to put that out there. Um, I agree it's not possible to know if people particularly interpret negative results um, I mean, I think people always say, you know, you need to continue your screening, you need to continue your risk. I, I do this all the time for melanoma genetic testing in particular, uh, an area where you want to make sure people realize that genetic testing does not change their need to have dermatological screening. And I sort of am very upfront about that. But um, I, I think that 
this is a cat is out of the bag phenomenon, um, that negative results are really going to start to be generally returned clinically uh, via portal. Any of our panelists like to respond? Okay. There's a, a card up about halfway down. I can't see who that is. I apologize. Yeah, Introduce thanks. yourself, please. Sure. Uh, Kelly East, Hudson Alpha. And I don't want to, I'm going to talk more about education and training in a little bit. So <clears throat> I won't like steal my own thunder, but um, uh, one thing I just wanted to mention though is, you know, talking about these negative results and the people who might get false reassurance or overinterpret that negative. And, you know, we were you were talking about with newborn screening, it's state mandated. You have very broad participation in that. But I think at least our experience, I think others to date, a lot of our population screening programs are, they're opt in. And there's a inherent ascertainment bias in those populations of people who perceive benefit of that program. And you're going to have higher rates of people with that personal and family history in there. And so that, that risk is even kind of exacerbated. Um, and I think we just need to acknowledge that, be prepared for that. And when we think about the calculations, of those risks that whether we should really be using population prevalence or should we assume a kind of increased ascertainment bias there. Actually, my comment was, was somewhat related um, to your comment. Um, as these population-based tests, let's say for familial hypercholesterolemia or other conditions um, become you know, more available, we have to make sure that they're used in the population setting. Um, there are some examples um, from our carrier screening where um, providers are actually using it as a diagnostic test um, for a suspected, let's say, child with CAH or other condition. And it's just it's not appropriate because of, you know, the reporting structure um, and so forth. So we have to make sure that um, providers, even though these tests may be more available, may be less expensive and, you know, collected at home, et cetera, should not be used for indications other than, you know, what they were intended for. We are at the end of our time. Do we have, Erin, do we have a chance for one more question online or do you want to go to our summary? Okay. Is there someone going to read it? Yeah. Carol Horwitz, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, as, a, as a primary care doc, half of our jobs are to the screen these teachable moments um, and saying, you know, just because you don't, your testing isn't your lung screening cancer, your lung screening testing is positive, you should stop smoking. Just because you don't have diabetes doesn't mean you should be healthier. So I'm, I'm struggling to understand both why we, it, it almost feels like the concern we have here is more elevated than some of these other times that we screen and have negative tests. And I also am a little bit concerned that the idea coming out is that we want genetic counselors to do everything, but we just don't have enough money to do that. And it might actually be that weaving these things into primary care and handling the weight through other things will be viewed positively and it shouldn't be that as a loss. So as I turn it back over to Aaron, I want to echo that and say that PCPs give this kind of counseling all the time. And if there was some tool that let us know, you know, what the data showed, we could probably do it. The research agenda, though, really should tell us more about whether negatives change behavior in a negative way. Aaron. So I'll just do a 30 second wrap up. Um, I'm not going to give a robust uh, readout of all the good uh, points that were raised. So Christine covered important concepts regarding the validating and stress testing, the, the pipeline, especially when thinking about high throughput screening. It's critical to have robust systems in place to monitor performance, both of the test and the uh, interpretation. Have to be really thoughtful when deciding when new advances plan to be introduced into the clinical sequencing workflow. Uh, we didn't talk about that much during the discussion, but that same goes for sample collection and choice of platform. Uh, we heard from Bob, new, the newborn screening considerations are, uh, around serious, urgent, and treatable disorders are applicable in the adult context. We really need to figure out how to hand off positive test results to clinical providers in the context of the U.S. healthcare system. Um, disparities exist. We need to do better to uh, include ancestries from underrepresented populations. We're seeing the value of that, particularly like Heidi described with NOMAD and the contributions to uh, increasing the number of variants that we can classify as benign. Um, it's imperative to have better estimates of prevalence of conditions, natural history of disease, and age-based penetrance. We need to calculate what is required into following up on positive findings, better understand harms of reporting false positives, and I'll stop there. Thanks. 
Thank you both very much. Um, I would note the lunch is, is up in the far corner there. The hotel people may come out and pull the table out so you can come down both sides, but if they don't do that, maybe one of you or a couple of you could do that without spelling anything. Um, so, and then, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and we'll be back at 1.20, please, 1.20 um, to start the next session. Thank you all.